this. This is the three camera cluster introduced first on the iPhone 11 Pro. This is the camera cluster on the iPhone 12 Pro. Here's the 13 Pro, and this is the camera cluster on the new iPhone 14 Pro. It's so big. <laughs> You know, at this rate, Apple's going to be making that Samsung phone, the failed one, the camera phone with the zoom lens. Remember that thing? But the camera bump isn't the only thing that got bigger on the iPhone 14 Pro. The notch did too, in a way. So that means that the most significant updates for the premium phone are the camera and the display. Let's try them out and see if they're a worthy update for the Pro. While most people care about the cameras on their iPhone, the thing I'm most excited about with the iPhone 14 Pro is the display. It's actually a major step forward in a whole lot of respects. Firstly, it's a way better phone to film videos like these outdoors. Typical max brightness remains at 1000 nits, but HDR brightness has gone up to 1600 nits. And if you go outside on a bright sunny day like today, the ambient light sensor can boost this OLED up to 2000 nits. Though this will definitely eat battery, but there's no more squinting at the screen, keeping it clean so emails remain legible. Look at it compared to an iPhone 13 Pro. Wait, why is it that every time I try to do a brightness comparison, they always end up looking the same. This happened last year too. What will also eat up the battery is the brand new always on screen. Long a feature on OLED equipped Android phones, Apple's finally brought it here too. Which is perfect timing, thanks to the home screen improvements added to iOS 16. Clock, notification, weather, and calendar widgets are all visible without having to touch your phone. What I love the most is the fact that it shows Apple Maps turn-by-turn -turn navigation. Usually when navigating, the screen is completely black until your next direction prompt, after which it stays on for a long time. The always-on screen, however, still shows direction information. That's really handy and could save battery on a long trip, even though unfortunately uh, it won't. Because Apple went all the way in their implementation of the always on screen. When active or asleep, it looks as if I dimmed the screen all the way to its dimmest setting in dark mode and then just left it on. It's quite jarring. Because alongside the information, the wallpaper remains on. Of course, there's more going on underneath to reduce the impact. Apple slows down the screen to one hertz and they claim to do some trickery to make skin tones and portrait wallpapers stay accurate. It kind of looks like an unlit slide photo. Now, the penalty in my usage is almost a day of use, and that makes me think that Apple may have gone a bit too far. Android phones let their screens go completely black, showing only the pertinent time, widget, and notification information when asleep. That goes a long way at making the phone appear off, allowing you to be more present. I think the easy solution for the iPhone is a wallpaper on-off setting. I've long thought that software these days isn't magical. I largely blame flat design for that, but out of the blue, Apple has given us the dynamic island. It's one of those features that when you see it, you wonder why nobody's thought of it before. Conceptually, it's a software embrace of the Face ID system cutout we were first introduced to with the notch on the iPhone X. Now though, the sensor array and front camera remain in a black monolithic pill. Then, depending on what background task you have running on the phone, the island expands and splits to give you increased information and access. This speaker girl is just going to get filled with lint. It's so thin. It's very lovely and lively, but also a start. I think it's slow. Kind of reminds me of the iOS 7 animations that made people sick. I do really love how alive it feels and looks, but I'd rather not have to wait to use it. The dynamic island should make something as simple as changing a song easier, but it doesn't. There are two methods of interaction. Simply tapping on the island will open the associated app, but long pressing inflates the island into a widget. I think this is backwards because most of the time I don't want to leave what I'm doing and tapping is easier. 
I love how Face ID registration is integrated into it, which makes sense, and I'm hoping they use this for more in the future. For example, notifications still appear as blurred rectangles below the island, and AirPod pairing is still a white panel at the bottom of the screen. I do worry how long the dynamic island is going to remain exclusive to the pro iPhones, because that might prevent it from expanding its capability as much as I'm hoping. Developers are not going to look for new ways to use this feature if the install base is a small, exclusive group of wealthy iPhone users. Now, to be fair, Face ID did get introduced into the mainstream models after only a year, and they should do that here too. So I guess the dynamic island on its own isn't enough to warrant an upgrade, but I do love it, and you will too if you get one. Now because the way this bright always on screen can drain the battery, you're gonna need a charger. And because the iPhone doesn't come with a charger, might I suggest this video sponsor, the Anchor Nano 3. It looks like a small phone charger, but is actually as powerful as the laptop charger that comes with the MacBook Air at 30 watts. And don't worry, their Active Shield 2.0 technology keeps track of your device's temperature over 3 million times a day, keeping it safe. It's available in five colors, like this lilac purple, which will match your iPhone quite nicely, I think. So check them out in the link in the description below. Do people buy the iPhone exclusively for its camera? Because <laughs> I can't get over how huge this is. I mean, it extends all the way past the halfway point of the back of the phone. Now, what's driving this change is an all new, much larger 48 megapixel sensor. Apple uses the extra pixels for many different things because Apple now employs pixel binning for the first time. It takes four pixels and combines them into one. So normal compressed photos from the camera are still saved at 12 megapixels. Second, the extra pixels enable a two times zoom option by cropping 48 megapixels into 12. Third, the extra pixels allow for a gimbal-like action mode for video. Resolution drops to 2.8K, but footage gets more stable. And finally, the extra pixels are accessible if you shoot in the 48 megapixel Pro ROM mode, though those files can balloon past 100 megabytes in size. So. If you only get a 128 gigabyte version, that comes to about a thousand photos, and that's including no ProRes video either. Oh yeah, and then try getting all those photos and videos off it. So how is it? I compared the 14 Pro to a bunch of different cameras. The 13 and 11 Pro, a Pixel 6 Pro, and two real cameras. Here's what I've learned. The low light improvements on the new iPhone help shorten the shutter speed, not reduce noise. In daylight, compressed photos of all the iPhones look heavily sharpened, and it's hard to tell the difference between the newer and older phones. I really found myself preferring the processing that the Pixel 6 does. Photos taken in Pro Raw are much better, especially if you do the adjustments yourself. If you are getting an iPhone 14 Pro for the camera, use Pro Raw, especially the 48 megapixel mode, if you can. They do look so much better. I took photos alongside the Sony ZV-E10 and Ricoh GR3. They are very nice, compact $800 APS-C cameras. Certainly they're more cumbersome to lug around than simply an iPhone in your pocket, but I noticed holding these that they're way more fun to photograph with. The camera ergonomics compel you to find and snap that next photo. That's something I have yet to feel with the iPhone. Like, I never take iPhotos. I'm still impressed with the photos you can get on the iPhone 14 Pro. Now, it takes great video, but a dedicated video camera is better. It takes great still photos, but a dedicated still camera is better. It takes great action video, but a dedicated gimbal is better. It's a jack of all trades and a master of none. Really, really great if you're in a pinch, but unless Apple starts putting in lenses like these, we're getting to the limits. If you have an iPhone 12 and newer though, I don't think you should upgrade, as you'll still be getting the benefits of Pro Raw. The 48 megapixel photos aren't enough, unless you're a glutton for selfies, because the autofocus on the front camera is a game changer. Though I think the regular 14 gets that too. The other improvement the iPhone 14 Pro gets is the A16 chip. In my tests, it's not significantly more powerful than an A15 powered 13 Pro, shaving only 20 seconds off a Lightroom export and showing mild improvements in Geekbench. It's not nothing and it's still miles ahead of the 6 Pro. And if you want the best performance in Genshin Impact, get an iPhone 13. So it's not worth an upgrade if you're coming from anything newer than an A13. 
every iPhone release leaves me reflecting on my waning enthusiasm. It feels like gone are the days of truly innovative and exciting updates and changes to the phone. But it's actually not true. There have been really sizable jumps between each generation. Even taking photos on this old iPhone 11 Pro feels like a trip back in time with the absence of ProRes and ProRAW options. If you are upgrading from one of these, you are going to notice a lot of differences. I think my waning enthusiasm can be attributed to the premium iPhone's increased price. It used to be that all the innovations added to the iPhone get added to the latest model that everyone ends up buying, and that used to cost $650. To get the best the iPhone has to offer today, you have to pay significantly more, in this case $1000, and it's not clear anymore when those innovations will trickle down. So far, I haven't thought any of these features are worth upgrading to alone, but what if you put them together? Well, compared to the standard model, the Pro gets a lot more features this year, and the price difference between it and the standard model is only $200. Every year is a good year to get a Pro, but you don't need to get a Pro every year. If you're coming from an 11 Pro, then yes, this is a great option. And if not, maybe just replace the battery. Thanks, Andy, for taking high quality photos of this MAC address. If you like the new camera on the iPhone 14 Pro, give this video a like. And if you're curious about the iPhone 14 Plus, you might as well subscribe. Now, I'm curious, are you the type of person who just takes photos exclusively with an iPhone? Comment below what that's like. Why do you do that? Do you miss having a camera? <laughs>